What's up everybody, GenX Dividend Investor here. In this video I'm going to tell you about European dividend aristocrats as well as pros and cons of investing in international stocks. So do me a big favor and please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Okay, normally when you hear dividend aristocrats, you probably think of those well-respected stocks that are members of the S&P 500 that have increased their dividend for at least 25 consecutive years. I'm a big fan of them, and in fact, 13 of the 27 stocks in my dividend portfolio are dividend aristocrats, stocks like AbbVie, McDonald's, and Realty Income. And if you didn't catch it yet, I actually added a new stock to my dividend portfolio recently, one I'll be sharing later in this video. Anyways, just because a company has an amazing dividend history of paying and raising their dividend doesn't mean that they're guaranteed to continue doing that in the future, nor does it mean that once they're on the aristocrat list that they'll remain on it forever. In fact, two companies in my portfolio were recently removed off the official S&P 500 dividend aristocrat list. The first was Leggett & Platt that actually continued to raise their dividend, but is no longer part of the S&P 500 and instead is a mid-cap stock, so it no longer meets all the list requirements. The other company that is no longer a dividend aristocrat is AT&T because they stopped increasing their dividend with their plan to spin off their Warner Media division with Discovery Networks, along with their intentions to then cut their dividend due to shareholders getting equity in the new spinoff. Now, the European dividend aristocrats have some differences as compared to the American dividend aristocrats, and I included links in the description of this video to the criteria that Standard & Poor's uses to identify them both. The first difference is that the EU stocks need to be on the S&P Europe 350 index instead of the S&P 500. The next big difference is that you only need 10 consecutive years of dividend increases for the Euro list instead of 25. So why would the default requirement only be 10 years? I think the main reason is because there aren't enough European companies that have 25 plus consecutive years of dividend increases, which in turn means that the index they've created wouldn't be diverse and robust enough. The Standard & Poor's methodology states that if less than 40 stocks are in the list, then to lower the bar to 7 consecutive years for European stocks or 20 consecutive years for American stocks. That being said, the default list on Wikipedia for European dividend aristocrats only has 31 stocks in it. Regardless, I decided that I would raise the bar beyond the 10 consecutive years that the methodology calls out and not only have that 10 consecutive year requirement, but also they need to have 25 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends, and I found 13 companies out of the 31 that met that elevated criteria. That's a lower bar than the American list, but a higher bar than the default one. I found it challenging to accurately find the full dividend histories of these European companies, but I listed the sources I did find in the description of this video. And because of that, I can't guarantee that the data I'll show you is completely perfect, so don't take any of this as accurate financial advice. But feel free to leave me a comment if you know of any mistakes I made, and I can update the video description with corrections. Okay, another difference to be aware of is that most American companies pay out dividends every 3 months, whereas most European ones pay out every 6 or 12 months. A final big difference, which I'll explain after I go over the stocks, is about taxes. So why would you want to invest in European companies? Well, one big reason is to diversify your income cash flow beyond the United States. And while many of my stocks get a large portion of their revenue internationally, I acknowledge that it would still give me another type of diversification to invest in non-American companies. Okay, let's begin. The first stock in my list is Novo Nordisk, which is an ADR, and I'll explain all about what that means after I go over the stocks, as well as we'll explain how dividend withholdings work and how you can trade international stocks and such. Novo is a healthcare pharmaceuticals company that is focused on diabetes, obesity care, and biopharma. Novo is on the New York Stock Exchange, trading under ticker NVO, and is headquartered in Denmark, which means they withhold 27% of your dividends if you're in the USA. Don't freak out about the withholding part yet, as I'll explain what that means and how you can counter it. They have a low 1.09% dividend yield, a low 5-year dividend CAGR of 0.85%, a 35% payout ratio, and they only pay out twice a year but have 15 to 25 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. I gave a range because different sources I used had different numbers. Moving on. The second European dividend aristocrat in my list is Sanofi, a healthcare company that engages in the research, development, manufacture, and marketing of therapeutic solutions around the world. Sanofi is traded on the NASDAQ under ticker SNY and is headquartered in France, which means they withhold 15% of your dividends if you're in the USA. They have a decent 3.75% dividend yield, a low 5-year dividend CAGR of 3%, a 51% payout ratio and they only pay out once a year but have 21 to 27 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. Moving on. The third stock is Essilor Luxottica, a consumer discretionary luxury goods eyeglasses company that also sounds like a great name for a strip club. You can buy them in the OTC markets, which I'll elaborate on when I go over all the stocks, and one of their tickers is ESLOI, which is an ADR. 
They're also from France, thus withhold 15% of your dividends. They have a low 1.34% dividend yield, a 5-year dividend CAGR of 16%, a 37% payout ratio, and they only pay out once a year, but have 27 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. Okay, next in my list is Fresnius Medical Care, a healthcare company focused on dialysis services. Fresnius is traded on the NYSC as ticker FMS and is headquartered in Germany, which means they withhold 15% of your dividends. They have a nice 4.68% dividend yield, a 5-year dividend CAGR of 27%, a 79% payout ratio and they only pay out once a year, but have 29 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. Okay, the fifth stock in my list is Walters Kluwer ADR, a research and consulting company covering health, tax accounting, and other specialties. Walters is traded on the OTC markets as ticker WTKWY and is headquartered in the Netherlands, which means they withhold 15% of your dividends. They have a low 1.17% dividend yield, a 5-year dividend CAGR of 15%, a 32% payout ratio, and they pay out only twice a year but have 31 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. The sixth stock in my list is Carry Group ADR, a consumer staples packaged foods and meats company. They are traded on the OTC markets as ticker KRYAY and are headquartered in Ireland, which means they withhold 15% of your dividends. They have a low 0.8% dividend yield, a 5-year dividend CAGR of 13%, a 17% payout ratio, and they pay out only twice a year but have 34 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. The seventh of 13 stocks in my list is Roach Holdings AG Basil ADR, a healthcare pharma company focused on treating things like cancer, AIDS, and others. They are traded on the OTC markets as ticker RHHBY and are headquartered in Switzerland, which means they withhold 15% of your dividends. They have a low 2.39% dividend yield, a low 5-year dividend CAGR of 3.7%, a 45% payout ratio, and they pay out only once a year, but have 30 to 34 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. The next stock in my special European dividend aristocrat list is Unilever, a consumer goods company with products you'd recognize like Breyer's Ice Cream, Axe Body Spray, and a bunch of others. They're traded on the New York Stock Exchange as ticker UL and are headquartered in the UK, which means they don't withhold any of your dividends. They have a decent 3.76% dividend yield, a good 5-year dividend CAGR of 7.7%, a 72% payout ratio, and they pay out quarterly and have between 21 to 54 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. Moving on, the next stock in my list is Diageo, or however you pronounce it, a company that sells alcoholic beverages worldwide that you'd recognize like Johnny Walker Whiskey, Smirnoff Vodka, Captain Morgan, Bailey's, Guinness, and Tanqueray. Sidebar, one of my go-to drinks is Tanqueray and Tonic. Nice. Diageo is traded on the New York Stock Exchange as ticker DEO and is headquartered in the UK, which means they don't withhold any of your dividends. They have a low 2.31% dividend yield, a mediocre 5-year dividend CAGR of 4.9%, a 66% payout ratio and they pay out twice a year and have between 22 to 30 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. I'll drink to that. Okay, the next stock on my list is Novartis, a healthcare pharma company. They are traded on the New York Stock Exchange as ticker NVS and are headquartered in Switzerland, which means they withhold 15% of your dividends. They have a nice 3.56% dividend yield, a low 5-year dividend CAGR of 3.3%, a 51% payout ratio and they pay out only once a year and have between 24 to 27 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. Okay, the 11th stock in my list is Coloplast AS Sponsored ADR. I'll explain what sponsored means later. They're a healthcare supplies company focused on urology and skincare amongst others. They are traded over the counter as ticker CLPBY and are headquartered in Denmark, which means they withhold 27% of your dividends. They have a low 2.64% dividend yield, a nice 5-year dividend CAGR of 8.3%, a 51% payout ratio, and they pay out only once a year and have between 24 to 27 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. Next, the second to last stock in my list is Sage Group ADR. They're a tech application software company that offers cloud software as a service products around accounting, HR, and a variety of other business functions. They are traded over the counter as ticker SGPYY and are headquartered in the UK, which means they don't withhold any of your dividends. They have a low 2.15% dividend yield, a mediocre 5 year dividend CAGR of 4.5%, a 65% payout ratio, and they pay out twice a year and have between 24 to 33 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. Okay, the last stock in my list is Nestle's ADR, a consumer staples company that owns a ton of brands you'll recognize like Toll House, Perrier, Nespresso, Hot Pockets, and tons of others. They are traded over the counter as ticker NSRGY and are headquartered in Switzerland, which means they withhold 15% of your dividends. They have a low 2.27% dividend yield, a mediocre 5-year dividend CAGR of 5.3%, a 
a 64% payout ratio and they pay out only once a year, but have between 25 to 62 consecutive years of stable or rising dividends. And that's yummy. Okay, now let's go over some useful information starting with ADRs. So if you do want to diversify internationally, then you'll probably buy ADRs, aka American Depository Receipts, which are certificates representing a specified number of shares, usually one, of a foreign company's stock. They look just like normal tickers in your brokerage. ADRs and their dividends are priced in US dollars for Americans and are an easy, liquid way for US investors to basically trade foreign stocks. I say basically because ADRs don't grant you the same rights as common stock typically does, though I read that the holder of a depository receipt has the right to obtain the underlying foreign security that the DR represents. Thus, ADRs have their own risk profile you should understand if you want to invest in them. ADRs are comprised of ADSs, which are equity shares of a non-US company that is held by a US depository bank, someone like JP Morgan Chase or Citibank. I recently started a new position in British American Tobacco, ticker BTI, on the New York Stock Exchange, and the buy order detail said that I bought British American Tobacco level 2 ADR. I'll explain what ADR levels are in a moment. And as a reminder, I wouldn't recommend investing in things like oil or sin stocks if you aren't needing the cash flow now. If you're young and or are focused on growing your portfolio size, then invest in growth stocks, which can be growth dividend stocks or growth non-dividend stocks, but don't go after cash flowing dividends just because you want to see your dividend income going up. It could be okay to do that if your overall strategy aligns to that, but just realize the various trade-offs you're making. Anyways, there are other ways you can invest in foreign stocks. Like you could open up a foreign brokerage account and then change your US dollars to some other currency and go that route. Another way to invest internationally is to use services that your broker might have. Like Fidelity has a bunch of options to invest internationally and they have webinars you can watch to learn about it. Many ADRs are in the over-the-counter markets, aka OTC markets, though some professionals consider trading in OTC shares as more speculative due to the lower listing requirements, thus it's important to do even more research in those cases. When I was looking for other ways to buy British American Tobacco, I found that ticker BTAFF existed, which looks to be direct shares in them, which sounded more compelling to me rather than BTI, but then I saw that BTAFF's volume was way, way lower than BTI's, so I just stuck with BTI. Five character tickers like BTAFF often mean it's trading on the OTC market, and if the last letter in the ticker is F, then it stands for foreign issue, and my understanding is that's basically like owning the stock. Many of those dividend aristocrats I went over traded on the OTC markets and their tickers ended in Y, which means they're ADRs. Beyond the ticker giving you clues about a stock, you can also look at its formal name that goes with it. For example, if the name has the letters SA, NV, or PLC in it, then those are basically the foreign equivalent of Inc. or Corp. When I looked up BTI on ADR.com, it showed me some useful info about it, like that Citibank was the depository, and then more googling led me to a document that said that Citibank can charge up to 5 cents per ADS share as a management fee. I asked some folks on my Discord about international stocks they owned, and most people mentioned that they had gotten some minor ADR custody management fees. It looks like the fee can be subtracted from the gross dividend amount payable, and or deducted from your account if the ADR in question doesn't pay a dividend. Another Discord user mentioned that his drip had a fee associated with it, seemingly from the ADR. I've not owned international stocks for a long time, so at some point in the future I'll tell you more about what my experience is with BTI. Now there are three levels of ADRs. Level 1 ADRs have the least amount of compliance and regulatory oversight and are traded over the counter. Level 2 and Level 3 ADRs trade on American exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange, which then also means that they have all the reporting requirements that the SEC demands. And as I mentioned, BTI is a Level 2 ADR. Okay, ADRs are categorized as either sponsored or unsponsored. Some differences include the fact that unsponsored ADRs only trade over the counter and don't have any voting rights. A sponsored one is issued in collaboration with the foreign company, while an unsponsored ADR is established without the company's cooperation. So a bank or whatever could just decide to issue one. Only sponsored ADRs may be listed on a national exchange and they must meet certain qualifications, otherwise they trade in the OTC market. Thus, BTI being on the New York Stock Exchange means it's sponsored, which you can also tell if you look at its sponsorship status on ADR.com. Now with all that out of the way, let's talk about withholding. Some international stocks can withhold some of your dividend payouts due to foreign taxes. And let me caveat what I'm about to share by saying I'm not a tax expert, so always consult a professional when in doubt. I barely know how to spell the word tax, and I'm not a fan of taxes, so do you really want to be learning about taxes from me? Okay, so the US government taxes dividends paid by American companies, but it doesn't withhold dividends for US residents. What that means is that if you own a US dividend paying stock and you live in the US, then you get your entire dividend paid out because nothing is withheld. 
However, when you do your taxes, then you may owe some money on the dividends you got throughout the tax year, depending on a slew of factors. But many foreign governments actually withhold taxes on the dividends that get paid to shareholders living in other countries. So if you own a foreign stock ADR, then, depending on the country the company is from, you might get less of a dividend paid out than you thought you'd get because some of it is being withheld to pay for foreign taxes. Like you might be expecting a dividend payout of $100, but you actually only end up getting $85 because 15% of your dividend was withheld due to foreign taxes. I found this list of default withholding tax rates by country that I'll include the link to in the description of this video. I say default rates because some of those countries like the UK, India, and Argentina do not withhold dividends paid to US residents at all due to tax treaties with them. Thus, since BTI is a UK company, it means that you should get your full dividend payout with no withholding if you're living in America. And then some countries, including Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Ireland, and Switzerland, have their dividend withholding rate lowered for people in the USA down to 15%, again due to tax treaties. So that means if you hold a Canadian company, then instead of the default 25% of your dividend being withheld, only 15% is withheld. I say only in air quotes. That being said, you can often get back some or all of what is withheld when you do your taxes, assuming the international stock in question was held in a taxable account. What happens is at the end of the tax year, your broker sends you your tax statements, and included in those should be all the foreign taxes that were withheld, which you can then use as a potential credit or deduction to reduce your tax bill. So if $100 of your dividends were held back as foreign tax credits, then you may be able to reduce your tax bill by that same amount. If your foreign tax credit is more than $300 for a single filer, or $600 for married couples filing jointly, then you'll have to prepare Form 1116 to get the credit. Apparently you can only use that foreign tax credit clawback for stocks in your taxable account, not ones in your retirement accounts. Thus, due to the tax-sheltered status of IRAs and 401ks, the IRS doesn't allow you to take any credits or deductions for foreign withholdings for those accounts. In other words, holding some international stocks in your IRA could mean you face up to a loss of 35% of your dividends with no way to get it back. The bottom line is that for tax-sheltered retirement accounts, you might want to make sure you only own U.S. stocks or own companies that will give you 0% withholding rate. Canada is an exception to the rule for retirement accounts because the 15% withholding tax that is normally imposed by Canada towards Americans is waived when Canadian securities are held within U.S. retirement accounts. What that means is that you can own Canadian stocks in your retirement account just like U.S. stocks and not worry about the tax withholdings. At least that's my understanding, but I've never personally tested it. Bottom line, there's a lot of nuance and variability when it comes to taxes, but hopefully this explains the basics to you. Okay, now I'd like to do a shout out of my latest Patreon aristocrats who have recently signed up. So thank you Jack Ross, and thank you Richard B. Aristocrats gain access to my dividend spreadsheet product that I use in many of my videos, and they gain access to private channels on my dividend discord chat server, where I let my upper tier Patreons watch my videos before I release them to the public, as well as let them vote on which thumbnails to use for my videos, and of course they get more direct access to me. Well that wraps it up. If you appreciated this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Thanks for watching, stay positive, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.